bonus episode features YouTube creator Caleb Pike. Check out his channel, DSLR Video Shooter, and his website, dslrvideoshooter.com. Welcome to a bonus episode of the NDI Film Awards podcast. I'm Matt, and in this episode, I have the absolute pleasure and honor of speaking to DSLR video shooter himself, Caleb Pike. Now, the name DSLR video shooter comes from a time long past <laughs> when uh, filmmakers were starting to use DSLR cameras, uh, like the, what the old Canon uh, 5D Mark II, Mark III, like back in that day. Um, I think this was like this was when was this like 2009 to really 2014 15 before these uh before the mirrorless revolution began but caleb pike has been on youtube for a long time and started with that channel he's also got a website dslrvideoshooter.com it's an amazing resource i mean there are there's gear reviews there are tutorials up you can buy used gear from the channel from a trusted source but most importantly to me are the video guides that he's created these camera guides there's also a corporate video guide this is high quality like master class type video production in guides to explain every single function of how to use a specific camera for your filmmaking or videography needs. But over on YouTube, Caleb offers free videos, free content, obviously, that covers all sorts of things regarding filmmaking, lighting, cameras, lenses. I think he is truly a unique entity on YouTube with genuine interest of helping the budget-minded indie filmmaker or videographer what you're going to get from caleb pike and dslr video shooter is honesty intelligence quality presentation all from a fairly budget-minded perspective from probably the kindest soul on youtube so it is my absolute pleasure to bring to you this interview i had the honor of having with caleb pike Sometimes you get the question, who was your favorite teacher, be it high school, elementary school, college? Um, I had none because I hated school, and I'm sure my teachers hated me. Uh, although I was taught by several great people growing up, it wasn't until I was much older that I found my favorite educator in Caleb Pike, and he has honored NDI Film Awards by joining me today for the podcast. Caleb, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it's it's such an honor and so cool to have you on. And, and I hope people are uh, uh, quite familiar with you and your YouTube channel, DSLR Video Shooter, as well as your website, dslrvideoshooter.com, where there is a ton of information and education and camera guides. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But I've brought you on today to talk to our audience about budget filmmaking. And for those who aren't familiar with the journey of Caleb Pike, how did you become interested in creating? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I was thinking about this, and um, I think it kind of started with the the umbrella category of maker. So I don't know if you're familiar with the whole maker movement. Um, Adam Savage, uh, there's a lot of people in that community and that's kind of, I would say I would include filmmaking underneath that. Um, so anyone who is, is, and you know who you are, if you're listening to this, you can't not create something. It doesn't matter what it is, drawing, painting, filmmaking. Um, I've always had that itch. Uh, so I, I've been a DIYer for a long time when I'm not running the channel, I'm, you know, soldering up stuff like I just modded one of my kids I found in the trash of a power wheels you know for kids like those little motorized things awesome double the voltage put led rgb lights in it and like I can't I can't not mess around with stuff like that so I've always kind of had that ever since I was a kid and then uh, it just kind of flowed into filmmaking eventually and uh, I love this discipline because there's so it's like being a builder right 
or being in construction. You aren't just putting in nails in the same size board every day. It's a very broad set of disciplines, uh, which I find uh, fascinating. And, you know, you're constantly growing. So uh, for me, it was just kind of messing around with building things, making things. And then, oh, cameras are cool. Start filming stuff. Oh, editing's fun. Oh, I'll do some try lighting for the first time because I'm tired of things looking crappy. And then uh, started putting the videos on YouTube because at the time, uh, right right before the birth of my channel, which this is 2009, I think, it was really novel and like cool to be able to upload 1080p videos to the internet. Like that was that was kind of fresh. And if you could do that, it was like, whoa, you've got the end to end full HD with the gold, you know, outlined box. Um, so I did that on Vimeo just because it was cool and, um, started uploading, you know, what I was learning with lighting. People started asking questions. I did follow up videos and here we are, uh, 12 years later, uh, as a full-time job. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, it's 12 years. Um, it's such a unique combination to have too, uh, as a maker, as a, someone who can passionately, do DIY projects and then also get into filmmaking and care about all of the little details required for that. That is such a great combination. I think that's for me, that's why your channel uh, is incredibly popular. And I know that I found you in 2014. 14, mm. I was transitioning from, and this is really embarrassing to admit, I was transitioning from camcorders on full auto settings to the world of DSLR mirrorless cameras when the GH4 came out. Um, I, I was, <laughs> I did about 10 years of professional work with uh, Canon camcorders on auto. And mm. when I realized I was behind the curve of the of the kind of the the 5D Mark II uh, with the Magic Lantern hack and in the 5D Mark III, I, I would see people with these bodies and go, "Ha! You don't even know what you're doing. I have a whole video camera." <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, I was humbled uh, soon after that when I just people I worked with I saw their footage and I was like, "How are you getting this gorgeous footage?" I just hadn't even realized what I didn't know. Uh, so that made me just so hungry for knowledge. And one of the first channels, I believe, to show us how to use the GH4, the Panasonic GH4, was your channel. And then I discovered so much more because you were teaching your audience not only about this camera, how to use this camera, but about lighting and 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 sliders and all of these things that were all new to me, lenses and and budget options. Uh, so f for me, your channel was probably the one of the first things that really got me into watching YouTube as sort of like replacing broadcast television. And um, and I absolutely credit you with starting the next level of my career by helping me through that awkward transition <laughs> where I knew nothing. So can you talk about the transition of being a freelancer and a, and a videographer to doing YouTube full time and just being this educator online? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I early on wanted to be in the narrative field, creating narrative, you know, filmmaking, um, and uh, as I worked more and more, you know, like a lot of us, we start in broadcast or wherever we can start. So for me, it was a lot of um, low budget, you know, corporate work to kind of broadcasty event stuff. And um, I, as I was doing that, started this channel. And I, I had a web background messing around with WordPress and blogging and stuff. So it was pretty easy just to throw together a site and uh, just start as a hobby, putting these videos up. Um, and I, I, I chose the name DSLR Video Shooter because that was the DSLR revolution, as we called it back in 2010 with the 7D, the 5D. And uh, having an SEO background, I just really jumped on that. Now it's a bit uh, aged. <laughs> but uh, so I, what happened is as I was working, 
Um, I was also developing this this site that slowly grew and it started, you know, generating some income. And uh, from then, from that point, 2010 to 20, about the time you mentioned you started watching 2014, mm-hmm. um, I just slowly reduced the amount of work I was taking in because the channel was starting to develop more. And as anyone out there knows, in the you know getting started world, corporate video is not very fun. Often, you know, you're filming, you know, not stuff that's not interesting, and the budget's not interesting, <laughs> or and or, um, you know, it's just not it's growing you. You can't, you know, it's hard to like experiment with book lighting when, you know, it's uh, in a factory and you've got five minutes to get some B-roll. So um, I took less and less gigs until I was just doing one or two huge gigs a year. And then I finally just decided, you know what, I'm going to go all in and uh, focus on the channel. So... Uh, the transition was smoother than you'd think just because it was, you know, it was still video production. A lot of people, or there's people that, you know, uh, make fun of a lot of us YouTubers like, oh, you know, well, here in the real production world, it's like, no, we're producing fully fledged projects every single week. And that's not exclude. That's not including our long form stuff. So uh, it's a lot of production, a lot of editing. It's still full on production. It, we don't have a client, though, uh, which is, a, a you know. A completely different thing, that's for sure. So, so that was uh, the kind of the transition for me, being able to work from home, being able to, you know, focus on on what I love, which is making things and helping people figure out how to make things easier. Well, and how helpful that has been. You know, I caught your live stream yesterday. To deviate a little bit here, I caught your live stream, and a question was asked, and you were able to talk a little bit about dealing with burnout Mm. and doing so much on YouTube and just not wanting to play the game, really. And no, no, those those are my words, because I am fortunate enough to work with a couple of really great YouTubers, but behind the scenes, I've experienced their struggles and kind of burnout. And, um, you know, it's just a game you have to play, especially with YouTube, and they mess around with the algorithm and you often don't know the rules of the game and uh, you're just kind of subject to whatever they do. Mm -hmm. And I think this year I've seen YouTube just take a real big hit as I guess the world kind of gets back going on track and views are down and revenue is down. And it just seems like uh, the, the algorithm is messing with all the channels that are popular. And, um, So I've seen the back end of that kind of burnout. Now, fortunately, the pressure's not on me. I'm an editor. So (laughs) it's the faces that kind of deal with with everything. But I have been able to help kind of produce and do things like that. Uh, So can you talk a little bit with us about the struggle of always coming up with fresh content and trying to balance fighting an algorithm and doing what you actually want to do on YouTube? Right. Yeah, it's um, with YouTube and I would say filmmaking as well, just in a different way. It's it's tricky to manage expectations. And and it's and, and I, I wasn't joking on that live stream. Like I really have gone to therapy for this. <laughs> yeah, because when you're when you're creating nonstop, uh, I think there's some serious decision decision fatigue that comes with that uh, when you're every single day and week in and out having to come up with an idea execute, deliver, and immediately start over. Um, and it's not, I've been talking to a lot of buddies of mine in the field as well. It's not like painting where you paint something, you put it in a gallery or you show it to people and you're done. Right. You pu- put all this work into it, you put it up and we no longer live in the world of here's something I made, take it or leave it. It's here's something I made, some people take it or leave it and then the algorithm will or will not you know, share it. Mm-hmm. Like people probably don't know, but almost every view on YouTube isn't you watching someone you're subscribed to. It's YouTube offering something that they think you're going to like. Mm-hmm. So if you look at my analytics, and this is true for, I would imagine, almost all YouTubers, if you get a lot of views or even not that many views, you know, 50 to 75% of those views is YouTube pushing it around to people. It's not people going to their subscription tab and watching it. Um, 
And so it kind of messes you and you, it's really hard to separate what, who you are from what you make mm-hmm. because they are very independent yet they're the same, you know, uh, not to go, you know, theological on everyone, but it's kind of like the Trinity, right? <laughs> Three and a one. It's like, this like mind bogglingly complex thing. Right. So it's really, I was struggling to separate those two. And then you're, then you, over time you inevitably, it's hard to separate creating something because you want it to do well, right? You want to reach more people. You want to, you know, put more bread on the table or whatever. Of course. Um, it's really difficult to separate um, yourself as a person from what you make, especially when it's just a machine pushing it to people. So that was part of it. And the other part is I think over the years, I kind of lost my way with um, just making it because I had to make a video that week and not what's the next thing I can make that'll really help people or should I do this review because, you know, I want to, or, or is it something that uh, could really help people? So that's what I'm kind of getting back into is, and I'm finding so much more joy in that, is um, things that interest me or, or things that I think could really help people. Well, I think that shows in the live streams. You're so engaging. You're so helpful. And it's, you know, there's a lot of people there. And you, obviously, you can't answer every single question that comes your way. Um, but I think uh, it's an incredible resource for people to listen to the questions that we all have as as creators who, you know, in, in all sorts of areas uh, with uh, camera gear, audio gear, supportive gear, um, maybe not gimbals <laughs> with, with sure. you or I, because I detest them. Um, but uh, it's it's an incredible resource, just your live streams alone. But the production value that goes into the videos you create, um, often they really just make me feel bad about myself. Your lighting <laughs> for simple, uh, you know, quote unquote, simple videos, your lighting is always so on point in your most recent video where you had a $3,000 budget to set up a shoot. I thought that was so cool. I actually carted up a bunch of stuff <laughs> that I'm about to oh, purchase nice. just cause I was like, you know, that would be better than what I'm doing right now. Um, for, for my corporate stuff. And, uh, it, I mean, just something like that is, is actually really helpful. So thank you for the live streams. Thank you for the, um, instructive education and for making things simple for people like me to understand and, you know, go into the description box, click the link, cart the item and be like, I can do it. Caleb Pike does. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I appreciate the effort that goes into that. But also speaking of effort, you put a massive amount of effort into tutorials and camera guides that are available on your website, dslrvideoshooter.com. Can you talk a little bit about the the effort and the time it takes to make these incredible guides that you provide? Uh, Yeah, um, it does take a lot of time, but I wanted a way, um, you know, a lot of people sell Uh, t-shirts. I I wanted to, if I was going to sell something, have it have some function. And so we uh, do camera guides, um, LUTs, and we're starting to get away from camera guides and more into just general filmmaking production tutorials. And uh, so those are available on our site. And uh, it's just a a way for people that maybe are on a live stream that, you know, a short answer from someone in a fast paced live stream isn't enough. These guides blow the the whole idea with these guides for me is if it's in the title, you're going to learn everything there is possible to learn about. So if it's a camera, you're going to walk away from that four hours of training, knowing everything about that camera, even stuff you didn't want to know or care about. <laughs> and so the same same goes for all of our future stuff. We're working on one called the Content Creator's Guide, uh, production start to finish, and um, giving people, you know, uh, all of these, and really my YouTube videos too. I'm just trying to cut to the chase for people. So instead of going through 12 years of pain and suffering, slowly figuring things out, if I can shorten that to a week of trying something and just, you know, cut to the chase... Uh, I love that because, uh, you know, that's what I appreciate from uh, people I watch. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to see that. I'm definitely getting that guide. I've bought a bunch of guides over the years. You have. You've been a, a huge supporter. So thank you. I'm like, as soon as I see. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I mean, I, I've got to I've got to learn these things. And it's you the way you make them. They are small, 
digestible segments of education. It's not some you know, four hour long straight play. Everything is its own little piece and you can go right to what you're actually interested in or what you need to learn or what you need to go mm. back and refresh on. Cause I find myself, I do that quite often, especially if there is a couple of months in between shoots or I'm using a different camera than I've used in a while. I've got to go, how does that black magic work again? <laughs> so right. I, I, they're just fantastic and they're so easy to listen to and they have great Audio quality, which I try to stress to our audience all the time. Um, so I mentioned the importance of audio in your guides, and I stress that every month at NDI because we get so many indie films that are made with bad audio. Can you talk about low budget options for filmmakers who, you know, there we get so many people who have a camera, they might have a shotgun microphone on their camera, and they're doing nothing else. They they don't know how to do audio, and then they do over-processing in post that makes it sound horrible. Mm. How can somebody on a low budget find great audio for their indie films? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely harder. It's easy when you're a YouTuber, right? Well, when you're trying to make a film... Um, I would say the first step uh, for, for short films is... Just like you scout, you know, for your scenes, you've got to write down to check for sound and think about sound because it's always the last thing to think about. Uh, and I've been there, right? Indie films, you're, oh, sweet location. Oh, great. Oh, last minute. We're going to switch this to this location tomorrow. You arrive uh, and there's like insane traffic or something. So I would say try to really think about sound. Um and set yourself up for success, you know. Um, you don't need a lot of money to make that work. Um, I would say no matter what, even if you have to change up your camera angles, um, get the mic as close as possible to your subject. Um, I my, my saying is, um, you know, keep your friends close and your microphones closer. The closer you can get them, you can take a $10 microphone and if, if you have, you know, it right up against your talent, it's going to sound incredible no matter what you're recording to. So I would say get a cheap recorder, get a cheap mic, the Rode, uh, let's see, Video Mic Go 2 is 100 bucks or $94. Fantastic little microphone. And um, get get a cheap boom pole or a broomstick and a recorder on the other end of that with an extender cable and just get that thing as close as possible. Uh, if you need to, um, you know, crop, you know, have a tight shot on your subject, uh, that allows you to get the microphone even closer. Um, and then, you know, get get room tone or, or uh, amb ambient sound. And that those two things together uh, is great. And then as you grow, if you can save up some money, buy isotope plugins. You would be blown away how many awful things you can fix with that software. It's not cheap, but they have some stuff that's just the, their voice denoise or dialogue denoise is out of this world. You know, if you have a on camera microphone you're recording someone with a highway next to it you can do wonders with that software um so that's a, a nice little cheat uh but yeah don't spend a lot of money just get that microphone close and take a second before the day starts and think about what you're going to do come up with a plan for sound that's absolutely great advice uh scouting your location you know you can scout a location a thousand times but the time the day you show up for production Something's going to change on you. Um, <laughs> exactly. For um, for my indie feature, we have a very critical scene that takes place in the dead of night. Uh, a, a very delicate exchange between two characters. When we were shooting that night, at a this is kind of at like a little pond area. We ended up shooting in the middle of summer and we scouted for spring and we had to push to filming push filming to summer well, i did not realize that during summer at this pond there are these gigantic birds that hang out there and are mating oh gosh so, <laughs> so we show up to shoot this scene and as we once we settled in and we're ready to shoot these birds and frogs fired up oh <laughs> so man this horrific audio of creatures around oh, us that and it's man. so distracting yeah <laughs> it was horrible so yeah you really got to know 
the the area you're shooting in. Um, that that's great advice. So, thanks for covering that for us. Uh, now, for low budget options for cameras and lenses and lighting, I know this is an incredibly g- general and broad topic. But if I just if I tell you, Caleb, I want to go shoot a movie, and I'm ready. I've got all my my actors and my scripts, and I've got my audio. Uh, what what kind of camera, what kind of lens can I get for, you know, let's say under a thousand dollars? What would you recommend for me as an indie filmmaker? Right, great question. Um, I am a big fan of used cameras. So for $1,000, you could probably pick up a Sony F3, uh, which is a full-on cinema camera with built-in NDs and the whole nine yards XLR inputs. It's a beast. Um, That's going to give you a really solid 1080p. You know, uh, you could easily shoot something on that and put it on the big screen and be happy with it. Um, So I love doing stuff like that. So going to eBay, searching, setting your budget, uh, see what you can get. Uh, another option would be you might be able to score a C100 from Canon, uh, maybe even the C100 Mark II. Both of those, all those cameras I just mentioned, are dynamite images, and you know those cameras used to cost twenty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, you know, uh, six thousand dollars. So it's it's pretty amazing what you can get these days on a budget. If you wanted to get something new with better, you know, autofocus, which I know is a thing these days, um, some slightly used Sony gear. Might be able to get the job done for you, an A6300. Uh, but I would tend to lean toward older cinema grade stuff because you can beat the snot out of it and it's just going to work for you. Those are great options. Wow, I didn't even think about that. The, uh, the You said the F3? Yeah, Sony F as in Frank 3. It's a Cine Alta uh, camera with a super 35 millimeter sensor. It's a great, great camera. Shoots original S-Log. It's great. What advice would Caleb Pike give to maybe not just filmmakers, but uh, creators in general? What what sort of advice would you tell somebody new who's going out there and maybe they're a maker and uh, want to pursue a career creating? Uh, great question. And I thought about this and it the, the thing that keeps coming to mind no matter what is maybe a, a weird curveball, but uh, don't go into debt um, or don't spend a lot of money. Uh, with anything in the making world, the easiest thing for us to do as humans, for whatever reason, we just love shiny things. We're really into it. Um, And it's so easy to get sidetracked with the tools. So I don't care if you're a woodworker, you know, looking at a new table saw, or, you know, a filmmaker who just wants the newest, greatest camera. Um, Don't worry about that stuff. We have so many great affordable tools Woodworkers will tell you you can make you know ninety percent of what you need to with a with a you know uh, a reciprocating saw or a, a table a cheap table saw. Um, you don't need you know a saw stop. Um, in the filmmaking world, you don't need a cinema camera. I mean, I I'm not going to be that guy who says just shoot it on your iPhone. Yes, of course, iPhones are great, but you don't need to spend twenty grand to get a camera. You can spend two grand um, and just get what you need to get through. And focus on what really matters. And in the long haul, if you spent, if we took all the energy we put into what we want to buy and trying to buy those things into learning sound design, learning record location audio, learning lighting, uh, we would have so much more knowledge and uh, then we'd really know what tools we can get away with. Um, so, you know, that's the advice I would give myself back in the day. Uh, and today, you know, especially don't go into debt, you know, don't cripple yourself with, uh, that because that's a big thing in our industry. Um, uh, especially when you just don't need to, um, free yourself up to invest in your projects, not in stuff that's going to get old and be outdated. That is exceptional advice. And Caleb, your wisdom is profound. Uh, your generosity for sharing your time uh, is is massive. Um, I appreciate you being on with me and and just taking some time to talk to our audience about these things. Uh, what are the be- where are the best places? Obviously, we've talked about YouTube, but what are the best places for anyone to follow you? Uh, sure, um, the the channel's good. Uh, Twitter is probably my next most uh, active 
area. So Caleb Pike, C-A-L-E-B-P-I-K-E, all one word on Twitter. And then Instagram, I'm trying to get better at, but I'm not super great there. But uh, I think it's also Caleb Pike on Instagram. And uh, yeah, those are probably the best places to, to hang out. Wonderful. And I'll have links to all of those in the description box of this episode. Uh, Caleb, is there anything we didn't talk about that you feel you need to mention at this point? Um, Only that uh, thank you for this podcast. And we were talking before the show about, um, you know, this uh, film festival. And I think uh, we need more stuff like this, just uh, a way for people to create developing that that uh, uh, habit and discipline of just making something and sharing it with the people. Um, that's such a wonderful thing to do. And um, I, I always, you know, as someone who also uh, creates for for other people and just trying to help out, I, I love seeing stuff like that. So um, thank you for keeping this thing going. That's a great, great run <laughs> of keeping this up through the, the pandemic and everything. Uh, that's kind of you to say. Yeah, it's killing me. So, <laughs> uh, we love to do it every month. We have such great interaction with our community. We've made uh, friends that'll be friends for life going forward and um, met some really great creatives and just have had a lot of fun supporting uh, other creators. It, so it's it's been it's been awesome. Thanks for mentioning that. I appreciate it. All right, Caleb. I'm going to let you go. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Hopefully we'll talk again and everyone should go follow Caleb Pike. Go subscribe to DSLR Video Shooter on YouTube and uh, up your game with the wisdom and education this man provides. Thank you, Caleb Pike. Thank you so much, Matt, for having me on. Find more information about our guest in the description box of this episode. If you'd like your project discussed on the podcast, go to ndifilmawards.com and submit to our open monthly competition. Find us on Instagram and YouTube, NDI Film Awards. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of the NDI Film Awards podcast.